Hello everyone, today is January 7th and this is first session of the Wyco Trading course. Uh, we're gonna have 15 sessions and it's always exciting to start the new cycle, uh, to meet new people, new traders, new Wycoffins that are coming into our new universe uh, and becoming part of our community and we welcome you. Um, and for those of you who are guests, uh, you know, just for this session, please enjoy this session. If you have any questions, email me, go to our website, browse through our products, offerings, free offerings, um, you know, maybe you decide to attend other classes. And if you have, you know, questions about the course, I will be happy, uh, happy to answer those uh, either via email or today. You could always ask the question, just type in it in. Uh, so for those of you who already signed up for this session, there are two groups of people, actually three groups of people. Uh, for this session that we are having today. The first one is uh, students who already signed up and uh, you are new students, um, you haven't taken this course before, so I will be addressing you in a specific way. I will be, uh, throughout this whole lecture, I will be giving you certain instructions as to what am I expecting from you a week from now. We'll talk about the homework, we'll talk about uh, some books that I'm going to recommend, um, uh, you know, some additional material that I want you to read or to view. Um, and uh, um, the second group is the alumni. And um, it's always fun to have uh, students who have gone through the course and they come back just because there is so much material and just to absorb all of this material in, in, in one set and could be a little bit hard. And um, uh, I've had so many great comments from alumni uh, when they take uh, the course for the second time. And obviously we give you guys a discount. Uh, so for those of you who are alumni, if you feel that you need to refresh your knowledge, and obviously from each cycle to another cycle, I'm, I hope that I'm improving the material add into the material or explaining it in a different way. Um, so hopefully that's going to be helpful. And the third group is guests. Uh, so again, for, for those of you who are guests, welcome. Uh, and I'm so happy that you are here. Uh, our Wyckoff price structure series, the beginning, the first four sessions, starting with today's session, are going to continue into January 14th. 21st and 28th. We're going to meet uh, at 3 p.m. Pacific. For those of you who know me, uh, I'm extremely bad with time management just because I want to give you guys a lot of the stuff. Um, and sometimes we kind of, you know, spill over uh, just a regular five o'clock um, ending for the class. So this cycle, and this is the new innovation, I decided that officially we're going to have the class for two and a half hours from 3 p.m. to 5.30 uh, p.m. Pacific. And um, as you know, those who attended these classes before, sometimes we go to 6 o'clock as well. Sometimes I feel like we need to finish uh, the exercise, so we need to finish a lecture, and we'll do that. So um, I would say that you know, keep like three hours for the live session. And obviously you don't have to stay through the whole session if you need to go. It's all understandable. And, um, you know, if you are unable to attend a live session or we have so many international students that live across the globe, um, for, the, uh, for those of you um, who live uh, outside of the U.S. Um, or, you know, the... Uh, this continent uh, and this time zone, uh, all of our sessions are recorded. And uh, I post them each evening after the class. And usually, you know, the latest by the next morning, you're going to have the video uh, from the last class and the slides as well. Uh, for those of you who are guests, to register for this course, go to our website, wikafanalytics.com. You could find the course either on the homepage or um, you know, just browse through the website and find the uh, correct pages. Sign up. Um, we have uh, a discounted price right now at 998. That will last uh, probably until January 14th. 
um, and that is for the 15 webinar or recorded sessions. Um, all of the recordings and slides will be available to you guys, uh, you know, who signed up for this class. Um, this particular session uh, will be posted on YouTube channel. So right away, please uh, make a note of this right here at the bottom, um, left bottom uh, on this slide. I'm posting an announcement that uh, we are recording this session and it will be on YouTube. Uh, if not tonight, then by tomorrow morning. And again, if you need to go, um, you know, just keep this in mind and you can watch it uh, at your convenience. Uh, a really quick announcement for students who already signed up for this course. There is a specific way how I want to receive your homework. Um, and we've been doing this for over 15 cycles now. And um, yeah, I, I think even more, maybe more than 20 cycles. Uh, I want you to submit your homework just in one file. I don't need to receive multiple files from you uh, with all of the charts. Please combine those into one, um, uh, one file. And uh, the, my preference is always uh, PowerPoint or the PDF or the doc format, you know, the word doc format. And obviously we want, I want to see your first name. You don't have to put your last name and you could mention what uh, number of the homework uh, it is. I save all of your homeworks. I go through all of them. I review all of them. And the reason why I do this is because I need to understand what kind of mistakes we're making as a group, what kind of commonality we have among us in the way how we view uh, the instructions, the material, and so on and so forth. Um, so, and I'll talk about this more as I will explain uh, next week's homeworks for you guys. And the last announcements, and this is extremely important uh, for those of you who signed up. Um, our classes are extremely interactive. Uh, the first class is the only class that is a lecture. Everything else is, um, um, is a class where I'm going to be lecturing and then I'm going to open up the mic to either a specific student or to everybody and everybody could comment. And as we go through the exercise, uh, I will converse with you. So this means that I would like you to have um, a microphone available to you. Um, usually I recommend a headset with the built-in microphone. That works the best. That's what I'm using. Um, and, um, you know, as alumni might uh, tell you or other students from other classes, there is a lot of interaction that happens in this class. The reason why I interact with students is because I want to understand how you think and what is the issue in your analysis. Um, and th it's throughout the conversation that the truth kind of comes out and it's easier for me to teach that way. Um, and it's been like this for years and years, so uh, that's a very common thing for us to do. All right, so we're done with this. Let's look at, and obviously everything that we're discussing today in this uh, lecture is for educational purposes only. You can stop the recording and read the whole disclaimer. What are we going to look at today? So today, as usual in the first class, I'm going to show you some examples of my trades. Uh, yes, I do trade and I teach and I teach what I trade. Um, I uh, trade uh, my predominant time frame is a swing time frame. Uh, and there are a couple of distinctions there uh, that I usually have either very short swing trades from a couple of days to a week or so. Uh, or swing trades that last for months. And then I also um, started doing in the last two years a lot of, you know, campaign stocks. So I'm going to show you um, some of those trades as well. And obviously this is just uh, something to um, highlight the method, the analysis, the execution, the tactics. Um, I'm also a person who is um, uh, extremely honest with my students and I show my mistakes and I think that I need to um, I I want to be in the space of um, 
you know, honesty with my students. I want you guys to show me your mistakes and um, I'll show you mine. And together we, we're going to learn from that. We're going to analyze. We're going to post-analyze. We're going to figure out what is it that we're doing right or wrong. Um, so this is the type of relationship that, you know, I usually build with my students. So today we're going to look at um, four traits, uh, two of them on the short side and uh, two of them on the long side. Uh, some of them uh, were great traits, some of them were good traits, and some of them were bad traits. So we're going to look at where mistakes were made. Also, and this is something that I usually don't do in this class a lot, but whenever the market is extremely active, I, I tend to discuss the market almost in each class, just because I know how difficult it is um, you know, to be exposed to the market. And then when something happens, uh, you know, obviously students have questions and um, I'm bom bombarded with emails, you know, uh, what do you think, what's happening, could you look at this and that. And I will talk also about the like of market discussion class that we uh, conduct on Wednesdays. Um, currently we have a promotion, I'll mention that. So um, I think it's appropriate today very quickly go through the market analysis. Then after that, we're going to do the uh, course overview. I'm just going to touch on the main subjects that we're going to cover um, in this four series. And then after that, we're going to start um, with the actual course. Uh, we're going to start with the introduction to the Wyckoff method. We'll talk about uh, Richard Wyckoff himself. Uh, we'll define what composite operator means to us. We'll talk about the price cycle, which is a predominant um, framework for us. And then we'll start with the main uh, structural concepts, which is a change of character and then the traits of the accumulation and the distribution. And obviously, this is just an introduction. This is something that I'm just giving to you guys um, to maybe even think about what's coming next, you know, and to think uh, about the benefits of this knowledge and how you could apply this knowledge uh, uh, in your trading. And then we'll definitely look at the homework. Next session, for those of you who already signed up or who are planning to sign up, we're gonna go into the details of the price structural analysis. We'll first, we'll review the homework. And by the way, the most common question um, you know, from students who signed up was obviously about the recordings. So you will have the recordings almost instantly. Um, and then the second most common question was, um, can I email you a question and ask you if I don't understand something? You can definitely do so, but my preference is to look at your question and answer to the question during the session. There is a uh, much more value for me and for students in the class if I answer your question um, in the next class. And obviously I want this question to be related to the content that we are discussing at the time. So any questions that might be uh, covering some material that is ahead, I'm just gonna say, we're gonna study this uh, later on. Or I'm gonna say, keep this question for session number 15, which is gonna be a, um, a Q and A uh, session for us. And then some of the uh, questions that does not require me to write a lot. I might just, you know, quickly write an answer. Uh, but predominantly, we will be uh, answering and looking at those questions during the next classes. During the next class, uh, we'll talk in session two about reaccumulation and redistribution uh, within the structure of the price cycle. You know, some distinctions there are some labeling distinctions. Uh, and the biggest question here on the reaccumulation um, and the redistribution is, let's say it was the reaccumulation, is this a reaccumulation or a distribution? And it's, it, you know, the market obviously gave us such a puzzle in 2018. Uh, so, um, and I think that puzzle is still unfolding, by the way, you know, it's by no means uh, that we are, you know, out of this formation yet. It's just still keeps unfolding. 
Um, so, but we'll talk about the traits of the reaccumulation and the distribution dis uh, distinctions between reaccumulation and the distribution and distribution um, distinctions in labeling and so on and so forth. And then after that, we're going to go into the details on the price structural analysis, where we will discuss uh, how to identify the phase boundaries. You know, and we'll talk about the phase analysis. Why do we need that? Um, and we'll talk about this today a little bit. We'll talk about phase C identification. For those of you who are familiar with Wyckoff methodology, phase C is kind of like a very crucial phase um, uh, in the price structure. And uh, within that structure of phase C, we'll talk about uh, types of sprints and shakeouts. Those are specific price action um, that we identify. They happen in a specific way. So we uh, want to be able uh, to identify those and develop the skill to recognize those as they happen. Uh, we'll talk about the sign of strength, um, and that is uh, beyond phase C, going into the next phase D. Uh, so, and sign of strength is going to act as a change of character. Um, and that's session number two. Um, each session will have some kind of homework. So, uh, one of the things with students from each of the cycles that I've conducted was that the course is too intense and that um, it requires, you know, definitely time to follow the course. And unfortunately, I have only marginally um, valuable answers to these comments to you guys. Um, I think it's always the pace of a specific student uh, that I'm discussing. If somebody has time and you are very serious about this knowledge and you want to get it as soon as possible, then yes, you have to do your homework each week. Um, and if you skip it, then make sure that you come back, you do it, you send it to me, and then you watch the video with the review or uh, you know, at least you have some kind of questions. If you don't have a lot of time to do the homework, then I think the best assignment for you is just to make sure that you just go through the video. And um, you, you, as you go through the video and you watch it, I want you to make some notes. And those don't have to be very extensive notes. I just want you to kind of like stop the video, think about the concepts, write those down, uh, write those concepts in your own words, um, and that would be the best thing. This way, you are acquiring the knowledge, you are absorbing the knowledge, and during this course, I will be repeating concepts over and over and over and over again, because that's how our minds work. Our minds are, uh, you know, and especially if you, uh, as myself, not that young, you know, it takes time, you know, to go through some of the concepts, and there is nothing wrong in that. We just need to repeat them over and over. So, um, as you could already maybe see, um, you know, see, I'm extremely passionate about this material, uh, trading in general, like of method in general, and my students as well. I like to see the progress. I like to push you guys. So I kind of have a tendency to be a little bit, you know, kind of. Uh, pushing you to the limits that you allow me, you know, to push you. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the values of this course. And I've heard these comments before from students um, that they appreciate my teaching style and I appreciate that comment and, you know, the fact that a lot of them just come back. Um, but that's, that's the intensity and that's the style that I have. Um, and again, if you feel that it's a little bit too much, it doesn't mean that you don't you don't have to take the course. Take the course, but go at your own pace. You could always, um, you know, buy the course and then go and watch the recordings at your own pace. Send me homework. Send me questions. Uh, maybe come to the live session if you want. Um, I would actually do both if you have time. Live session and then watch the recording again. Again. Uh, this session is being recorded, and I will post it on our Wyckoff Trading Method uh, um, channel on YouTube. By the way, check it out. We have 
quite a few videos now and um, almost each week there is some kind of update there is some kind of upload of a new video so check out our uh, channel and you know for those of you who want to sign up go to our website uh, currently the price is still a discounted price so make sure that you sign up before um, it goes up all right so let's let's start with the first case study and the first case study well because you know there's such a bearish sentiment right now and obviously rightfully so we we have had low highs lower lows uh, a conventional TA definition of a downtrend so obviously you know I wanted to look at the at trades that I've done that were on the downside so we'll look at Novotier and we'll look at Russell 2000 and here are these two trades first let's look at Novotier so Novotier was a very interesting uh, case study and I think that um, it probably requires more time to spend on this and um, to fully understand um, how and at what point our bias is changing and at what point uh, tactically we would be going in into this position and um, you know establishing a short position um, and again I'm guys I'm extremely honest with you as to what I thought or what my trades were um, at one point or another so as the price was still making higher highs and higher lows my bias was still to the upside and in, in a lot of cases here in this trading range you would see the benefit of that obviously Novadir was um, such a big leadership stock um, in this uh, business cycle that we've had uh, it was one of the best stocks uh, you know to have uh, for companion it was one of the best swing stocks as well so there was nothing wrong here um, in my opinion in this trading range to still have a bias to the upside because if you're a swing trader you're gonna initiate your positions close to the support and then uh, whenever they fail that's when you want to get out of those positions so even in this upslope in trading range with higher highs higher lows you could manage uh, you know uh, being uh, maybe not entirely right on the long-term bias but be right on the short-term bias and still extract some money out of this um, also please note that because of the leadership characteristics because of the strength that this particular stock and the group you know semiconducting group uh, has exhibited for years in this business cycle the distribution does not necessarily look like a distribution if you look at the first initial reaction that starts with the buying climax after the climactic run which we identify um, in this course as the first point of excitement look at the initial reaction it happens on three four days down very uh, quick sell-off but then a very quick run up to the same highs so what does it tell us someone's selling but somebody's still buying some institutions are still seeing some value in the stock so at this point of time we just notice in this price action price development and we are saying that there was a change of character in the way how the price was going down on big volume signature and how it quickly recovered and at this point of time we would be thinking that we're going to develop a trading range that's our logic at the time we know that we're in the potential phase a uh, which should show us a buying climax automatic reaction and secondary test so all of these three points are here in phase a so th at, again at this point of time you might be thinking this could be a reaccumulation um, and that's exactly uh, the point of view that I had when uh, the market made a high at the end of January and had a very sharp reaction into the February low. Novadia looked very good. It looked much, much better than the market itself. So this is a natural tendency for us to get, um, you know, and 
to the stock and to select the stock that has those leadership characteristics during the times of market volatility. Then um, I'm not going to go through phase B. There are some points that we could talk about, like a minor sign of weakness here, attempts to upthrust the way and the texture of the price and the volume signature that suggests that there is no supply at this point of time. And that suggests a rally, which does happen. And it happens in very uh, familiar way um, of how some of the rallies in the trading range develop. And um, as we are reacting to one half of the range and on the next rally, we are attempting to overcome the point of upsloping resistance. We see that there is only a temporary commitment to the upside. There is only one bar, one close that is above the previous high. And then the price just quickly fails back into the trading range. So therefore, a question here is why would this happen? Um, you know, what uh, if the stock is so strong? Why is it failing on the breakout? And we obviously could see that as the price goes back into the trading range, there is a gap, there is a, a down spread that is increasing, and also supply is increasing. Those are all elements of ins potential institutional selling. So we want to make sure that we are not necessarily shorting a leadership stock right away. There were so many other stocks to short before that, even before October and September, that were already in the downtrend. If you look at some of the stocks, um, you know, even if we look at Russell, look at the September action um, compared to um, other indices um, and other stocks, you could see that stocks in Russell 2000 have been exhibiting already the weakness. So on the first leg to the downside, this is where you have to be. You have to be in the weaker asset. But um, as I was actually uh, conducting a presentation for StockCharts.com on Market Watchers Live, I actually had this position. Um, and I've entered this position on the second leg to the downside. This was the actual bar where I have um, initiated this position. And uh, this type of the positions I always uh, conduct um, with options trading. So I just put di uh, put, uh, bought directional options with um, and I have to look it up a little bit better, uh, what was the expiration. But usually for this type of short-term trades, I would have the expiration a month or two away. Um, I'm expecting a uh, drop to the downside and explain in a second why. Um, but first, let's talk about the timing. Let's talk about the selection. How do we transition from a leadership stock into the stock that is for sale? and into the stock that we could short with confidence. Well, this whole move right here, look what happens here. It's a change of character. The stock is starting to behave in a different way. We're seeing multiple gaps at the open. Uh, we're seeing how the down spread is increasing. And comparing this move to the previous moves to the downside in the same trading range, this is probably the most aggressive move to the, to the downside. Not only that, look at the distance that it traveled. This is the largest distance to the downside in this trading range. So if they sell, they actually progress to the downside. We will be discussing in the second portion of the course, the relationship between volume and price or as we would um, identify it in different terms, the relationship between effort and the result. So we're seeing for the first time that all of the attempts to push the price down in the trading range were unsuccessful. And for the first time, um, not only the distance um, that, uh, of the reaction has increased and the character with which it moves, but also we are seeing the increase of the supply signature or rather increase of the downward effort. 
and it's being synchronized with the downward result. And that's what we're looking for um, in the selection of the stock that has concluded some kind of formation and now shows to us that institutions are um, selling at this point. So that was the determining factor for the selection of this trade. Everything else was kind of very much mechanical, you know, uh, because tactics are tactics, they're not going to change. Uh, we're identifying the first leg to the downside as a sign of weakness. And then look at the rally, a very weak rally. Um, it cannot even come back to one half um, of, the, of the trading range. And then it just fails. So um, the position was opened on this bar uh, right at the, uh, at the open uh, after the price went through, uh, through the previous low. And it was an enjoyable trade just because it happened so fast. So from about uh, 236, you know, to 188, that's about what? Um, so almost like 50 bucks. And it happens so quick. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven days, seven trading days. So a week and a half. Um, and let's see if you are a swing trader and a short term swing trader. This is a very quick uh, profit. Um, and also think about the leverage, right? So I'm putting on puts, options. So I'm definitely leveraging uh, this position. Now, the reason for closing the position was that um, we have made a low low below the low of the automatic reaction. And we are clearly in the oversold condition here. Um, the volume signature is not that climactic, but we're anticipating that at this point, we might have some kind of stopping action. Why? Well, because selling does not happen consistently. There is always some kind of um, institutions that are going to find some value as the price moves to the downside. Because if they are holding their position and they are thinking, well, Novadir was a leadership, even in this climate, I'd rather hold on to this stock because it's, it's a leadership stock. Then at some point, as the price goes uh, to below the point of where they bought or they thought that there is some value, they're going to step in and they're going to start buying. And we see that from the volume signature. So a lot of the conversations that we're going to have throughout this course is going to be about institutional sentiment. Where do they find value and uh, where do they find liquidity? Those are the two things that institutions um, require in order for us to, uh, uh, they require in order for them to open the position. So increasing the volume signature suggests increasing the institutional activity. And we see that there was a move to the upside. So some of them were buyers at this point. There was no reason for me to wait for a potential trading range to develop. That was the thought at the time. So the exit was just at the close. Um, and initially, I thought that my analysis was correct. Uh, and I thought that after the selling climax and automatic rally, we had a secondary test and we are in phase A and we're gonna continue um, a trading range until the next lag to the downside as a continuation. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. Um, the price just tanked and it tanked on the institutional capitulation. This is where institutions are just giving up their positions. Um, and we must say that there is a difference between um, a strong hand or a weak hand. There is, uh, you know, um, institutions that are acting at this point of time as strong hands and some institutions are acting as weak hands. Um, so obviously capitulation happens uh, on the selling of weak institutional hands. And then some of the strong hands that are seeing that there is some, again, some value um, that was not there for them at 190, 180, but they seen some value at 150, 140, 130. So they are stepping in and they're uh, stopping the price from moving further down by uh, initiating their uh, uh, buy positions. So that was a relatively easy and quick trade. Um, 
uh, emotionally very stable because the price basically drops and that's how it usually happens during the bear market um and i really enjoy actually shorting um it's just that we haven't had an opportunity to short for quite uh, for quite some time and i don't mean just short you know specific stocks um but market in general talking about the market so as we are continuing with um with the development of the bearish sentiment in this area right here i had quite a few calls to the upside and i'm actually totally okay with that um there are two things that you have to remember it's all about the context of where we are and how we trade and the context here is that as we have already established let's say a bias to the downside it doesn't mean that there are no trades to the upside that we could exploit even you know on a short-term basis so as the market was going down in the second leg right here we could see that the supply is actually being exhausted and um, um, my call here was to the upside and i still stand by that and i thought that was a great call because the call was just for a swing trade uh, or for the rally to happen. And actually it happens, you know, a couple of times actually um, uh, on other markets, on other indices, that was even better. So I'm gonna show you some of the trades in this area right here, if you're a swing trader, you know, and how to exploit that. But in this case, a continuation happened after a failed spring and we'll talk about the spring and the definition of the spring later on guys so don't worry about that um, but it acted uh, as a failed signal and a failed signal is probably the best signal in technical analysis that you could find why bill because usually a failed signal will have a very quick shift in the sentiment where the majority of traders were on the wrong side of the trade and then as they close out their positions either via stop loss or capitulation that produces a big counter move to the sentiment that preceded that and we kind of see that it happened exactly this way well first of all we are coming out of the apex formation so here we're thinking that the velocity is going to increase on the way down you know if uh if the sprint fails and as it fails it gives us a very very uh a great tactical place to open the position which obviously i took advantage of um and uh, uh not necessarily was the best exit right here and um, you know i think that further down the road we could discuss this whether in the wake of trading course or in the practicum um but I still felt that it was much better than not to be um, exposed to the market at the time when the bias was so bearish. That's number one. Secondly, at the time I had some long positions, uh, which were campaign positions or even swing positions, and I wanted to hedge. So one of the ways to do that is exactly this. Um, you know, you could hedge through um, opening the position um let's say against some of the positions that you have with the different bias and that was the idea and it worked out somewhat uh, okay somewhat perfectly i'm just kind of thinking more about the exit here my preference would be to exit a little bit lower right here on this close why well because this um shows to us this bar um shows on the volume signature um a climactic action so this was more uh, uh, truer selling climax uh, characteristic uh, than on the previous bar. Um, and the reason why I was thinking now I'm remembering this is just the close, close that um, had a little bit of the uplift and that we didn't really experience before that. So um, I remember that was the thinking. Also, look at the oversold condition right here even this bar the exit bar has been already in the oversold condition and uh so therefore and the volume signature was relatively high 
it was uh, one of the highest that we have had and if we use the analog of how the price actually stops here there was a suggestion that somewhere here there might be a stop in action so that was the logic um, but definitely could have been a little bit better um, as an exit so these are the um, couple of trades that um, I've conducted during this um, uh, bear market but as I've mentioned uh, there were some trades that I had on the loan side and I definitely want to acknowledge that that's number one I want to explain the logic I want you guys to understand the logic so we'll go through uh, through that and um, um, hopefully after this post analysis you kind of would get a feel of first how I trade secondly you know what I teach and thirdly and more importantly how could we use Wyckoff methodology to define the selection and to define the tactics for us a question here from Eric after the sign of weakness to the exit at 188 is better um, is better not to operate was that the question Eric okay so after the sign of weakness um, to the exit of 188 okay better not to operate I don't know it worked out right so um, I think what happened here is that institutions started to sell and um, there was not a lot of selling actually if you think about you know what this move to the downside what it had in terms of the force to the downside we could see the increase in the supply signature but if we would compare it to the previous attempts uh, you know to sell off it's actually was less of a force to the downside yet look at how quickly we move into the downside so it means that there is no resistance for the price to stop at some point and to react to the upside it just there are no bias at this point so that was the logic of the continuation okay and Eric hopefully I understood your question if not you could just re-ask let's look at the next case study and this one is a Canadian solar uh, this particular stock I have been uh, stocking for some time and um, I'm gonna go through the analysis first to the point of entry so that you would understand the logic of why I'm in this position I'm still currently in this position this is a campaign position meaning that I'm going to hold on to this position for quite some time. I want our, I want this position to develop into a sustainable uptrend where not only this stock but the group itself and the peers are going to confirm that we are in the campaign mode. And it all starts with phase A where we see the final climactic action with increased spread gaps to the downside huge volume signature that represents both increase of the supply and increase of the demand increase of the supply from weak hands and increase of the demand from strong hands and I will teach you how to identify um, you know th those two categories of traders and you know on the price action and the volume action and then multiple tests which I'm putting into phase A and then phase B was very interesting the whole selection for this trade was based on phase B and somebody might be thinking who knows like of methodology what the heck what is he talking about how could you define a selection based on uh, uh, on uh, uh, phase B well look at where phase B is residing it's residing on the top of phase A and early phase B also on the top of the potential um, preliminary support which happens before the climactic action what does it tell you well it tells us one thing that the institutions bought in into this position and then they didn't want to get rid of it and the shakeout has specific characteristics that we will study 
And this shakeout happens so fast, it doesn't produce a lower low relative to the climactic action. It's actually a higher low. And look how quickly there is after the capitulation, which is still institutional capitulation, they are thinking in terms of the quarters. So multiple quarters, the stock is not showing absolute return and the stock is not showing relative return. What are they going to do if the stock starts to go down? They will get rid of it. Uh, uh, they will get rid of the stock from their portfolios. And this is exactly the volume signature and the price behavior that tells us that story. So out of this, we have a, a relatively quick recovery, which tells us that this was just an kind of institutional short-term capitulation where the uh, um, a lot of other institutions actually picked up all of their shares. And we're seeing multiple tests. By itself, this low is a test to the previous lows in phases A and early B. Then multiple local tests. And my point of entry actually was right here. Um, so what am I seeing here? Well, I'm thinking that uh, from this point on, we are probably gonna just go up into a potential sign of strength into phase D, meaning that we're expecting the price to overcome all of the levels of the previous resistance. And then um, it doesn't happen right away. There is a smaller shakeout. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we study is that type of the behavior. When you identify the character of the stock as to how it moves, how the price moves, and obviously that's all uh, being based on how institutions are behaving or how, um, you know, uh, weak hands are behaving. And um, this type of shakeout is to be expected as we have seen before this type of the behavior. So you should not be uh, extremely concerned until the price actually hits our stop loss, which is below uh, the low, uh, the main low. So I'm still in this position, even the local shakeout is happening. I see positive actions here where there is a quick reversal of the low where there is some value, and then there is a test. So that looks great add to the position here, I just missed that, but wanted to have a confirmation. I wanted to see, um, I wanted to see a positive, um, positive position before I start adding to the position. So I let this rally run, but this rally was really great. It showed to me that um, indeed, you know, this is the stock that is worth my attention. And the Wyckoffian structure is concluding. You know, we are in the potential of phase C, and we have the rally that has a lot of momentum. And remember, guys, from conventional technical analysis, momentum always will precede price. Mm, quickly losing my voice in, in New Year. The next shakeout or shakeout type of reaction is all market-related. It's not stock related, it's not group related, it's all market. Volatility of the market takes even the leadership stocks down. So therefore, we just need to assess as to what kind of damage the market could do to this particular stock. Again, we are out if our stop loss is being hit, there is no question about that, but it's not. Instead, we are seeing high or low, and we still want to stay in this position. And currently, you know, I'm still in this position. The goal is very long term. Um, but the logic as to how I'm getting in, how I'm selecting the stock or how I'm getting into the stock or how I'm going through such a period of volatility is all white coffin. It's a, the, all of this analysis of staying in, adding to the position or getting out of the position, all based on white of studies, white of concepts. And I kind of would like you to see the benefit, um, you know, through actual trades of studying the methodology and um, you know developing the skill of visual recognition of all of those concepts. A couple of questions here. 
Okay, great. I like that the group is active. This means that we're going to have a good cycle. Hold on a second. All right. So um, this comes from Charles. Oh, Charles, hi. Just a thought about Eric's comment. Uh, by stopping to operate, he might have meant should one have continued looking for immediate opportunity for new trades? Just a thought. Um, okay, yeah, I could see that point, Charles. You know, and we're still talking about Novadia trade, so I'll come back to that trade uh, into that slide. Uh, you know, if you have any other thoughts on that, uh, so I could definitely see that. And then again from Eric. Um, in Canadian Solar Phase B, um, is that an upthrust or up, upthrust action, and what's the difference? All right, well, yes, we definitely have multiple upthrust situations here, all right? So we have a first upthrust here, another upthrust here, another upthrust, another upthrust. So what are the upthrust? Upthrust are just temporary commitments to the upside above the levels of the resistance and then almost instant return back in uh, under that resistance and we're seeing that in all of the cases this is what we see the price commits temporarily and then comes back under the resistance almost instantly now the difference between up thrust and up thrust action and all of them are just upthrust action, in my opinion, at this point of time, is that um, when we say that this is an upthrust action, we actually suggest a specific bias, which is to the upside. So upthrust action will be discussed during the accumulation and during reaccumulation. Upthrust will be discussed during the distribution or a redistribution. We will talk uh, about this more and in more details and specifically in session number three and four, we will talk about the distribution a lot. And I will give you a lot of the you know, uh, definitions on upthrust, upthrust actions, uh, sprints, different type of sprints, shakeouts, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's all ahead. All right, next question. In phase A, which is the automatic ra ra uh, rally of the first leg to the intermittent line, or the candle with the weak point into the straight line. Oh, Eric, what's the question then? Which is the automatic uh, rally? Okay, got it. Yeah, so Eric, I definitely feel that you know the, there is some knowledge behind it, uh, behind the question. Actually, in my opinion, there are three automatic rallies here you could just because we're discussing phase a that has this testing this area is a test um, and it's kind of the conclusion of the testing of phase a uh, we had multiple attempts to go down so this is of the same magnitude as the cell and climax so therefore we want the test to be of the same magnitude as the climactic action um, uh, from that perspective we might have multiple um, automatic um, rallies and this is again something that will go into the detail this is a little bit more advanced so usually this stuff we uh, we leave for the practicum which is the continuation of the Wyckoff trading course um, and this is a little bit more of the advanced concepts but really good question uh, from Justin um, Ramon, how do you pick your entry point, uh, entry prices? Um, so I've developed kind of like a proprietary reversal mechanism um, where I'm identifying specific bars that are reversal bars and that um, act as what I call a point of no return. This type of bars suggest that uh, a reversal has happened and you need to, um, this would be the most optimal point of entry. It's below these uh, points of entry, or rather the lows, where you could have the, the best reward to risk um, ratio. And these are the points of the lowest risk. And as by coffins, we always want to open the position 
let's say if we're opening the position to the upside after the reaction, after reaction, after reaction, after reaction, there are two spots only. One was identified by you know Wyckoff himself, and then the second one we added in the Wyckoff trading course. And again, this is something that we'll talk about. We will talk um, in month number four, in uh, March, April, about tactics. How do we get in? I will show you um, the Wyckoff way. How you know how his logic worked on the entries and stop losses and exits, and then in the practicum as a continuation. We will definitely, you know, talk about, you know, this proprietary technique that I'm going to show you. All right, let's look at another trade or another case study. And this case study is about Shake Shack. Uh, for those of you who, you know, follow my analysis and follow us on either wikofanalytics.com or, you know, presentations that I um, occasionally give on stockcharts.com. Um, you know, you're probably familiar with this uh, trade that I've done. Uh, we, I also have a description of the first trade on YouTube, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That was a really good trade, a really good swing trade. This is kind of like a very typical trade that I would have, um, you know, in the market that is a bull market. So for the bear market, you know, this type of trades are not necessarily going to work. And this will you will see this just almost instantly in a second uh, but this trade was great it was based on the idea that the earnings are going to be uh, having a favorable reaction and we're going to have some kind of uh, push into the overbought condition on earnings and uh, the plan was just to get out of this position on the excitement of weak hands that I still getting into this position and therefore I want to leverage this I'm using options calls um, and this was you know one one of the profitable trades in 2018 which was you know kind of like uh, vastly profitable uh, and you can see why um, and uh, the point of entry the first point of entry was on this bar again this question as to how do you choose your entry points I will explain later but as you could see a little bit premature entry the add-on was much better was more much more optimal in terms of the uh, point of entry the price was the same but um, I had to sweat it out for a couple of weeks into the next uh, into the next add-on I'm adding here at the same price because I'm seeing what is um, happening here on earnings as uh, the price gaps down it doesn't really go that much uh, below the low there is only one bar that commits to the downside and then there is an instant recovery so by itself it acts strong uh, after a negative reaction to earnings and also you know there is a much much longer term structure a trading range that has developed and had a major sign of strength and we are in the potential backing up last point of support type of action um, after that everything is mechanical kind of easy there were some other points where you could add to the position here is one here is another here is another and then before the earnings itself you could actually you know uh, uh, if you are a speculator like myself um, you could create position even here uh, with the weekly options uh, and it worked out really nicely I'm thinking that this is a buying climax that we're gonna have some kind of uh, trading range at this point a lot of supply that is coming in on this bar again something that is not necessarily visible to a maturistic eye but I will show you how to decipher the volume signature based on the price action to understand that the supply is coming in at this point so I just closed the position both of them and uh, obviously we see that supply has come in but absorption is happening uh, pretty fast um, and that was the suggestion to still keep at least a portion of the position um, as a continuation all right so that was the first trade but um, the next series of trades that followed were in a different environment remember the market environment 
uh, from February, March, April lows, where we had absorption in the market of the supply. Um, so that was favorable for this trade. What happens next is not as favorable. We are in the September, so we already have some slight deterioration, yet we are in the stock that is a leadership stock, that's number one. Secondly, that shows a correct Wyckoff structure, both in the trading range and also in the uptrend itself. And we are at the point of the support, which I'm interpreting as phase C. I'm entering uh, position intraday on this bar, which acts as a potential sign of strength bar, suggesting that there's gonna be a continuation at least to $70. And instead, the price just reverses. It reverses in a specific way, we're still thinking that the sign of strength is developing here. Um, and then a backing up action, a small reaction, which should um, come to the support and then reverse and continue to the upside. And this is where the failure happens. So this bar right here shows that failure. Um, I'm not necessarily closing the position right away. I'm thinking, well, could this be that this phase C was not phase C, but we still were in phase B. And could this be a potential phase C? Not a lot of supply comes in, like we've seen, let's say, here. So that was the point of the hesitation. Um, I felt good when the price recovered, but it recovered to the same levels of resistance that we've encountered before. And once after the lower high, we have the next failure, I'm out. And actually, I think that in my opinion, and I tell my students, that this is a good trade. And again, in your minds, you might be thinking like, wow, what is, he, what is he talking about? Why is this a good trade? It is a good trade because you give yourself an opportunity um, to profit from a continuation of an established uptrend. And if you fail, then you just need to quickly close that position and just get out with your risk management. I'm not losing more than I need to, but I give myself that opportunity and it just didn't work out. The next trade, so uh, if the first trade was a good trade or you know the best trade or a perfect trade, well, not the perfect, the exit was a little bit premature. Um, the second bad, uh, trade was definitely, um, I would call it bad trade. Uh, so what is happening here? So I think I'm being emotionally caught up here um, in the previous trade. And um, I'm playing the earnings. So entry number five, which um, actually pre was preceded by entry number four. So entry number four on this bar right here was an entry pre-earnings. It was a day before earnings. So my um, my analysis shows that there should be some kind of positive earnings. I just don't know what kind of reaction is going to be to the positive earnings. In the bear market, the positive earnings sometimes could produce a negative result. And the institutions will be selling into the strength of, uh, of weak hands that are trying to react to positive earnings. So therefore, I'm just basically uh, wrong on this entry. But I think where I'm kind of proud of myself as to how I managed that, uh, that mistake was by recognizing that the earnings day itself has elements of the selling climax. We have an increasing volume signature. We are coming to the point of support, which was defined already by three points. So it's a legitimate downtrend. And if this is a selling climax, then we could profit from some kind of reaction to the upside. Each time when we have a climactic action with that increased volume signature, increased spread to the downside, we know that there's going to be some attempt to go up. 
So what I'm trying to do and compensate for the loss, which I still have as a position, is that push to the upside. And um, it happened exactly in the way how I was thinking it would. I didn't uh, knew that, you know, we're going to recover that fast. And um, um, this bar was really good. And here the question becomes is in the environment where the bias is to the downside. An attempt to commit to the upside more times than not is going to become an upthrust. Same here in the same spot. So once the upthrust develops and the price quickly come back, comes back below the resistance, there is no reason for me to wait and I'm closing the majority of my position. Now, I left some and this is just a negligible um, position, but still I wanted to see how I would manage it. And as the price goes down, Look at what happens. I'm seeing that the selling is exhausted. I don't see the same type of selling that, let's say, we've seen somewhere here off the top. So this type of selling produced this violent reaction. But here, selling is more exhausted. The supply is exhausted. Um, so, And we see that also in the spread to the downside. And once we come into the oversold condition, which we are identifying as potential stop in action right here, then I'm thinking that there's going to be another reaction and we would be seeing probably a reaction back into the point of the resistance. So you kind of could see that I'm explaining to you guys how I'm managing the position even when I get into some trouble. And I think this is a very important skill for us to develop. And it's not like I'm doing this all the time. This is the skill um, that an advanced trader needs to develop to understand how the structure unfolds and what are the most opportune points for us to act upon. So um, again, something that um, we will be discussing during the uh, uh, tactics um, in March, April, um, briefly, and then we're going to discuss it more during the week of practicum. So this is a very interesting case study, you know, on the, all of these traits. So this is just like, uh, um, you know, a godsend because it shows uh, to my students, you know, first of all, the mental outlook, the uh, analysis itself, and tactics. A lot of tactics here with this position and therefore it's just like in one example you have everything the good the bad and the ugly it's just I love it all right some questions here in Shake Shack can we assume from entry two at 42 the price is increasing is due to no selling supply available institutions uh, have it all I would like um, if you can explain the volume signature about uh, that entry two please okay so entry number two yeah and um, the logic is correct Eric uh, the increase of supply shows the increase mostly into the earnings event and after that supply is still relatively high on some of the bars but then it goes down but not only that one thing that I want to for you to see is that the not only supply is going down at this point, but demand is increasing as well. And this is also extremely important. Look at the demand on this bar and even on this bar right here. There is a lot of demand on this bar. Again, something that we will study in the second months. But comparing this area and this area to what we've seen before into the reaction, we're seeing a definitive increase in the demand signature. So what does it mean? Institutions are coming back. They are establishing their positions because they see what? They see value. And also on this type of bars, they see liquidity. And liquidity is extremely important event for them to participate in because of their size. They are huge. They have billions and trillions of dollars. And for them to open the position, someone has to sell in order for them to buy that big position. 
Again, something that we will be discussing later in the course. Can we assume if we see an increase in the volume as each selling climax in the downtrend channel that the context is fast price falling and the price is near uh, to go up to the automatic rally? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the questions are phrased a little bit strange. So we will work on this, Eric. Um, so in, we are looking at these spots right here. So increasing the volume signature, what does this suggest? Stop in action, right? So why is this a stop in action? Well, because the volume increase usually will have the increase in both, in supply and demand. We just want to uh, understand what dominates at this point. Supply still dominates the demand, but demand is absorbing the supply on the way down, and then it's absorbing on the way up on the next bars or multiple bars. The same happens here. Absorption of the uh, supply, supply is increasing, but demand is increasing as well. Supply is still dominant over the demand, but that absorption, that occurrence um, of the demand, um, and then subsequent buying after that, we see that in the next three bars, suggests that there is value, there is liquidity for big institutions that are coming in, they are buying, and that suggests some kind of at least attempt to rally. And that's the big distinction, because if the bias is to the downside here, then the distinction is going to be that our trade is going to be just a rally. And I think that in this post-analysis, this is one of the mistakes that I made, you know, later on with this particular stock, that, you know, um, more so here than here, uh, that we are in the downtrend, and therefore, all of the trades, even if you open it at the very opportune time, which, which this entry was just perfect, um, you have to be faster getting out of the position. So the entry, uh, the exit was relatively okay, but could have been much better. And by the way, guys, you know, during the whole course, this is the mentality that I have. I don't like when people say that, oh, um, you should not be thinking about perfect entries and perfect exits. Well, I don't think this way. I don't like it this way. I don't like to think this way. What I like is for us to study how, where exactly we're gonna uh, come in into the position, at which spots and why, and um, where exactly we would be exiting and why as well. And I want us to concentrate on perfecting our skills, not only recognizing what is developing in front of us, but also developing tactical skills, execution skills as to where we open the position and where we close. And for whatever reason, everything has to be logical. Otherwise, do not do that at all. All right. Um, Dog is asking, um, could you speak about establishing reward and risk as it appears sometimes using price support um, as stop loss leads to potential large dollar percentage loss? Um, yeah, so I'm going to be extremely quick here, uh, Dog, because we just this is a little bit out of the scope. So on your point of entry, um, define your point of entry, define your uh, point of risk with the stop loss, define the risk itself, and that's going to be in dollar, uh, in dollars here, and then define your target. So, for instance, here I've defined the target from the long term chart. I'm just showing in, on this chart, with, this is where my target was. So, the logic here was as the price exhibits climactic action in the target zone, I'm going to exit. And that's exactly what I've done. So if you understand where your point of entry and let's say your minimum target of let's say $56 um, and then the risk here is what? Um, about like two bucks, two and a half bucks. Then um, you could figure out what's the potential. So $18 of reward and then $2 of risk. So what is our risk to reward ratio? It's $18 
divided by two dollar and that's nine to one so this is a really good reward to risk ratio and it worked out very nicely it's a different risk reward ratio here or here right so we were thinking about 70 as our target maybe slightly above as an up thrust above that maybe 72 73 74 um, we also could use the pnf here right to calculate the potential well it didn't work out so uh, it doesn't matter at that point um, why getting into the position before earnings it's gambling get in after uh, this one is from michael um, yes, I agree with you, Michael, and I would say that for beginners and intermediate uh, traders, don't even do this. You know, if you don't understand how to trade earnings, um, just avoid them. Although, throughout the course, I'm bringing a lot of evidence to you guys that um, um, earnings are actually a subject of institutional uh, bias at the time. And I'll talk about this in the course. I'm not going to develop this into a whole discussion, Michael, right now. But you know, just uh, uh, let's discuss this during the course. It's just a big, big topic. Okay, another comment from Michael. So um, between February 6 and 9, stop by the resistance from the top to June 11th. No long positions until charm. Uh, clear direction yeah and uh, this is what I'm I'm discussing Michael you know obviously this was ugly and obviously a lot of the mistakes was made here but my point here is that um, when you make mistakes guys a lot of you are and I see because I worked with so many traders and so many students I see that you're withdrawing and I understand this pain it's an emotional pain and usually as humans, we are just built this way to survive, to go away from emotional pain. And market always has an opportunity for us, you know, to produce this type of pain when we are doing something not by the plan, uh, when we are deviating from that plan, when we are misinterpreting the uh, what we see. And I think that's kind of like what exactly happened here in, uh, in the ugly trade. Uh, but it's a very valuable lesson to all of us and to me specifically because I was uh, trading this and you know just a small portion is still in that trade. And what is the lesson? Well, obviously, you know, uh, have a feedback loop into the trading plan. That's number one. Again, something that you know we discuss in other classes. And then, secondly, figure out how to manage your position, even if. Um, you know, you have a loss, especially with options. You have many, many uh, ways of how to uh, diminish your loss. So um, that's the way how I look at those things. All right, um, let's go to the next section. Okay, let's talk about the markets. And this is gonna be really quick because um, I just want you to understand the logic the, um, the my logic that I look at the market and our Wyckoff logic, which by the way, each Wednesday, uh, Bruce Frazier, my colleague, um, and a great Wyckoffian and I, we discuss um, in the Wyckoff market discussion class. Each Wednesday, um, all of our students come to that class, submit their charts, which Bruce and I review. Uh, we discuss the markets every time and we look at the at the whole market from the sector perspective from the industry group perspective the stocks in those groups we look at the commodities we have so many case studies that we go through um, we talk about non Wyckoffian um, uh, topics Bruce is an amazing storyteller and he's been in the industry for quite some time since 1982 so it's always amazing just to hear the stories, um, you know, from the past, and you know, uh, and also uh, listen to his interpretation. And uh, I'm going to show you three slides from the last Wednesday class, which, by the way, you can uh, find the whole uh, class on our YouTube channel. It was a free class last week, and look at what we've discussed during this class. All of these symbols 
we put up so that our students would see what's coming in our discussions. All of those were discussed last time. And currently we have a promotion for this class. You can sign up uh, at $79 a month, which is regular $99. And this offer is going to expire this Wednesday. So go to our website, find that class, sign up, and check it out. And check it out on YouTube, where we just posted that video, and it's a featured video. So what are we looking at here? Well, obviously, we are right here now. So I have not updated the chart. So we are coming back into a trading range or above this local climactic action, which is a bearish sign or a bullish sign. Well, it could be interpreted um, in either way, and we're still yet to see what's going to happen. So I'm going to show you both of the scenarios, bearish scenario and analog for the bearish scenario that I'm using here is 2007, 2008 market, where we also had the same type of upthrust action. We had the first leg to the downside that looked like uh, a structural point of the, uh, you know, related to the previous lows. Then we had a rally, uh, an attempt to create the new high and a failure. And even structurally, we kind of have it in the same way where we see a failure as a lower high, then a potential spring that fails. And remember that failed signal is the best uh, signal. So again, potential spring and then the failure. Uh, and how did it develop in 2007? Well, at um, I think in December, uh, the last December session, which was December 16, and we conducted that session, three of us together with Gary Fullett, which was so much fun. Gary is like such a great white coffee and just a great person, and he's just always so energetic, enthusiastic. Um, and uh, if you have a chance, you know, go and check out his offerings on Wyckoff Products. He is a very, very good um, intraday trader. He's a very good um, uh, Wyckoff and Wyckoff experts on volume and spread analysis. And Gary and I, we've conducted together a class on sprints and up thrust. That was a lot of fun and just uh, a lot of great information. So uh, kudos to Gary for doing all this work. So look at how we go in into the oversold condition. So we kind of called that continuation into the climactic action just based on this analog. And what this analog suggests was the wake of structure that we could be potentially in the trading range. That's scenario number one. And that's a bearish scenario where we could encounter some resistance at the point of the uh, support. Um, that we've encountered before, and then just retest, retest, and a trading range. A trading range like this would suggest a continuation of the down move to the downside like we did in 2007, 2008, and also in 2000 and 2001. All right, let's look quickly at a different scenario. This is not necessarily the scenario that is a preferable scenario for me. I'll show you another bullish scenario that I like more. But I want to point uh, your attention to two um, boxes here, two blue boxes. One of them comes um, in 1998. And obviously, we could um, compare uh, these analogs based on the economic environment and where we are in the cycle. What I like about the 1998 scenario is that it produces on a technical basis an oversold condition, and that's exactly what we've produced just recently. And this oversold condition is very significant because we have been in the secular uptrend for quite some time. So every time we've been in the oversold condition, we had out of that a very quick rally up. And if we're discussing a bullish scenario, this would be the most preferred scenario is just uh, uh, for bulls to have that quick rally. Why? Well, because if everyone is so bearish, who's going to sell? Who else is going to sell if everyone is so bearish? 
the sentiment is so bearish that um, at some point, um, if we are in the reaccumulation, this whole uh, move to the downside will be considered a shakeout rather than a downtrend. And uh, because of that reason, and I always look at both scenarios, by the way, and this is what I teach my students, we always look at both bearish and bullish scenarios. But if we're looking at the instances where the rally is going to be very fast to the upside, and that's going to have some elements of accumulation by institutions, then it makes a lot of sense that out of the oversold condition, um, institutions are going to cover their shorts and they're going to um, see that uh, big institutions are buying in and trend following institutions are going to also participate in this rally. Um, so one of the bullish scenarios is based on this diagonal, uh, not diagonal, but expanding tr uh, uh, triangle where uh, you have different environments in the structure where you have the reaccumulation texture uh, with the price and the volume showing uh, decreasing volatility, testing of the previous lows, and then the rally that fails and develops distributional structure and then has some kind of short-term downtrend. Look at what has happened in the 1960-1980 trading range in the markets. The same texture. We have the reaccumulation texture first. That suggests that from the low low, we're going to have either a sign of strength or an upthrust. becomes an upthrust. A lot of distributional qualities here and then a short-term downtrend. And then out of that oversold condition, we have a pretty good rally. Well, look at the recent development. Kind of has a lot of um, resemblances. Reaccumulation texture with the absorption in March, April, May, and the uptrend into the upthrust that develops also into the local distribution with the short-term downtrend. So the key for this analog to work is to obviously make sure that if we're going to have a rally, it's going to be fast and it's going to uh, quickly bring us to at least one half of the trading range. If, on the contrary, the rally will fail and we're going to have the retest and the trading range, I would favor more of a continuation scenario to the downside. Obviously, with uh, a small uh, asterisk here, if we're going to have something like what we've uh, seen in 2016, then you know this could be another um, potential reaccumulation. So these are the things that we kind of routinely, uh, Bruce and I, look at uh, WMD classes again on Wednesdays. The current promotion is going to be until uh, this Wednesday, uh, January 9th. All right. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to speed up a little bit, so I'm going to um, slightly disregard your uh, questions, guys, for now. Let's see at the end of the class um, how much time we have. Um, so I um, just feel like we spend a lot of time on the trades, but it was a good segment. So what are we going to learn in uh, Wyke of Trading course? Well, um, as I've mentioned, uh, the market structural analysis or the uh, price structural analysis is kind of like the dominant theme uh, with the Wyckoff methodology. If you think about what the method uh, covers, uh, except for the price structural analysis, and we would be talking about volume and price. Volume and price is covered in technical analysis. So you don't necessarily have to have the Wyckoff method you know, to discuss supply and demand. At the same time, there are obviously some distinctions. But talking about the price structural analysis, what what is there for us to explore? Well, we're going to start with the change of character. And this is an extremely important but very simplistic concept. And I'm going to show you guys how the environment changes and how we need to identify that change in order for us to understand how the price is going to behave in the nearest future. Uh, we also, that will lead us to that price structural environment, whether we are trending or non-trending. And if we are trending, you know, what kind of uh, trend we are in. Then we're going to talk about 
week of phases and week of events. So whenever we go into the consolidating um, uh, into the consolidation, we want to conduct a phase analysis. Uh, phase analysis is all about identification of specific week of events and specific. Uh, characteristics that belong to those events that help us to identify the bias, that help us to identify the timing of when the price is ready to leave the consolidation, and also a potential character with which the price is going to travel. So these are going to be our goals. Supply and demand is going to help us out uh, both, uh, you know, not even both, uh, in all of that. It's going to help us out to define the bias and confirm the bias. It's going to help us out to define the time as to when the price is going to leave. And also, it's going to be crucial in identification of the potential character of the next move. Now, if the bias is the primary concern um, of the beginner, the timing is definitely more of the concern of the intermediate trader. Character is all about advanced studies. So, and that's kind of like how it is with the course. We first gonna talk about the bias and timing, and then we're gonna switch in the practicum into the character. Um, one thing about the character that I will say, and then I will go away from this, um, character is extremely important. And you know, you know, in some cases, students come to me and they ask me a question, well, how can you possibly identify the character of the next move? Well, you look at the price and the volume, and it's all there. In a lot of cases, when students come to me, if the beginner comes to me and they ask me, what would you recommend me to read? What kind of books? We have all of the recommendations on our website, by the way, under the resources navigational, bar, uh, uh, navigational button. Uh, books that Wyckoff wrote himself, books that uh, people wrote about Wyckoff method, and also books on technical analysis. Those are the books that we recommend to the beginners. Um, to the intermediate and advanced traders, I recommend not to read books. And my only recommendation is to read charts because a chart always has everything that you need. That statement by Wyckoff where we have to judge the market by its own action is a very profound statement for me personally. And the um, majority of my studies, 99% right now, as you know, after 20 years of reading the books, reading the articles, is all about the charts. There is nothing else. So um, just kind of like a side note, on that. Let's come back to the supply and demand. What's under there that we will be studying? Well, obviously just the volume and price analysis itself and the relationship of the effort and the result, those are extremely important concepts. And then we will go into the details of the bar by bar analysis or uh, swing by swing analysis. Bar by bar is the volume spread analysis, as you know. And swing by swing analysis is extremely important, especially in the trading range. We will discuss the volume patterns in, of different WICO phases in different consolidations, which are accumulation uh, or distribution. And we'll talk about not only the volume characteristics, but the price behaviors uh, for those volume characteristics. And then we'll talk about historical analogs that I use even in the course for the beginners. Then our attention will shift to the relative and comparative analysis. Relative analysis, um, relative strength analysis is a pretty common um, analysis in technical analysis and I'm not spending a lot of time on that because usually students come well prepared but there are some specificity and especially contextual specificity to the Wyckoff method that I'm gonna be pointing your attention to. On the top of that, I'm gonna show you some of the things that I do or that I recommend to our students to do in filtering and scanning. And we will use something as simple as StockShots engine, uh, StockShots.com engine to identify you know, that selection 
and to go through those filters and scans. And then our last segment is going to be devoted to trading tactics and management. And you kind of have, have seen a little bit of the preview with some of the trades, some logic there, um, you know, and um, um, it, this is not, it, and the logic that I've explained is a little bit more advanced even and with some of the trades. We will be predominantly thinking about the points of entry, where do we open the position and why, uh, our regional stop losses and how we move those, and then how do we exit and what are the strategies um, on exit uh, that we could use. We'll talk about scaling in, scaling out, how that benefits our risk management profile, and so on and so forth. And then we'll also talk about different tactical scenarios. And this is more an analytical skill than tactical skill here. But, um, you know, tactics are sometimes more useful than analysis itself. And um, uh, some of the trades that I do just based on tactics rather than analysis itself. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned before, the course duration is uh, 15 session. Uh, we're gonna we're starting today, so our last session is gonna be on April 15th. The time that we're gonna spend together is two and a half hours, so this is 37 um, and a half contact hours for the whole course. Again, right now we are at the discounted price, so take advantage of that. All right. All right. Well, finally, we actually starting our uh, lecture in the material. Let's talk about Richard T. Wyckoff himself. Who was he? Well, I thought I think that he was a fascinating character, um, just because of how his life unfolded. Um, one of the most interesting um, pieces on Wyckoff, I actually read in Stocks and Commodities, Stella Asoba's article on Richard D. Wyckoff, which I believe was published either two years ago or a year and a half ago, um, during the summer of 2017, I believe, maybe earlier than that. Uh, it's a five-part uh, article. I highly recommend it, uh, not um, as an overview of the method itself, um, it probably uh, could have been more in depth, although I think that Stella did a good job, you know, talking about the method itself as well. But it was so fascinating to read about the life of Richard E. Wyckoff. He was um, um, an editor, he was a trader, he was, um, uh, you know, uh, an acquaintance, uh, acquaintance to uh, such big operators as uh, Jesse Livermore, uh, Herman, Cain, um, Khan, and obviously he lived in the era when JP Morgan was conducting his campaigns. And um, he, uh, what he did is he followed those stock market operators and he was collecting the um, data on their trades, interviewing them, and trying to extract their best practices um, uh, on how they conducted their campaigns. And the whole course and the idea of institutional presence, um, which he called the composite operator, is just based on his observations of those people. And um, it's just fascinating to think that he had access or sometimes direct access or through the interviews of uh, just living through that time and collecting the information on such amazing traders, um, uh, you know, at that time. And uh, uh, he codified all of those practices into the course. Um, unfortunately, his personal life was, you know, somewhat hectic and he died relatively young, I think, um, you know, for our time, maybe it was okay back then. Uh, he died in Sacramento um, in 1974, uh, 34, and um, um, after the third marriage, which failed, and where his wife um, took 
uh, the possession of almost everything. And I think that he was forced after the divorce and into the early 30s, you know, to create something else. You know, so his magazine of Wall Street was taken away from him. His real estate holdings was, were taken away from him. Um, his family was uh, kind of ruined in a way, and he had a very bad health at the time. Um, and I thought I, I thought a lot about this, you know, and sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, talking to him, you know, obviously, you know, from my mind, you know, and projecting what he would answer to me and to, uh, talking to him and uh, discussing, you know, his his life and, you know, what has been happening during that time. I felt that he was forced to write the course, uh, this next um this slide right here, the course that he has published in 31, 32, 33, 34, um, that's, th that's the main course that is left for us that is more sequ sequential um, as an educational piece. Now, whenever students ask me, um, and first of all, you could find this um, online. I believe this is uh, in the public domain right, right now. Whenever students ask me, do do you recommend to read this course? For the beginner, yes. But if you have a chance uh, not to read that course and read it later, I would rather you do that. And there is a reason why. Because that particular course is somewhat outdated. And my recommendation, if you want to read on Wyckoff, read Bruce's blog. And I've mentioned Bruce already. Uh, multiple times. So Bruce conducts a WMD session with me on Wednesday. Uh, Bruce is a blogger on stockcharts.com. A lot of you know that. A lot of you read his blog. But for those of you who are not familiar with his work, please go to stockcharts.com, find his blog. It reads as a book. I'm trying to push uh, Bruce to publish his blogs as a book. That makes a lot of sense to me. So we'll see how that's going to go. But all of our students are required to read his blogs, uh, whether you're going to start from the beginning, and sometimes it reads as a book. You know, he goes through the analysis, you know, and um, there are sequence of blogs on specific instruments that he has or a sequence of blogs on the specific concepts and so on and so forth. This is definitely a must read, and I would say even before the uh, uh, Wyckoff course itself. Um, so you could definitely study Wyckoff methodology through his blogs. If you don't want to read, come to the classes. If you want like more details, more in depth, and more interactive uh, stuff, then you know obviously a class would be the best. But definitely check out Bruce's offerings. All right, let's come back. Um, well, Wyckoff himself, um, I thought, was um, not only a great trader, but he was a really good businessman. And sometimes people disregard this, but because I'm in this business, I understand how hard it is to conduct this business. Because you always, um, you always on record. And as you could see, even today, I'm showing you the trades, and somebody's going to say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, or you shouldn't be doing this, and so on and so forth. So you kind of constantly being bombarded by the feedback of people. And um, I have a lot of respect for people who uh, who do this job and for Wyckoff himself because he was such a pioneer in this business. And at one time, he had over 200,000 subscribers. We don't have so many people subscribing to um, our current services, I, 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 I must tell you right away. But you know who did that? William O'Neill. And that's why I have a lot of respect for William O'Neill as well. And we know that William O'Neill, on the technical side of Canslim system, used a lot of like of ideas. And we have saw this as a confirmation, you know, from, um, you know, the comments of, uh, uh, somebody like uh, Chris Catcher or uh, Morales uh, and other people, and um, 
you know, even when you look at some of the volume on yield trades, not the ones that are breakout trades necessarily, but the ones that are long-term trades, they are very much like coffee. Um, and we'll talk a lot about, um, you know, the differences between the canceling uh, entries and exits um, and why coffin uh, entries and exits. There is a lot to learn there in the differences. Um, you know, I have a lot of students from canceling that come and actually really, really enjoy and benefit in the knowledge of Wyckoff methodology just because it allows them to be a little bit more in control on the technical analysis uh, side of things. It's definitely more in-depth uh, studies um, on the technical basis. And look what Wyckoff have done. He was publishing the ticker. Um, and here, this is so cool, an article with uh, William D. Gann. And that just tells you, like, he was living in such an amazing time for technical analysis, where uh, Dow was creating his theory, where Elliot was, um, you know, creating his structural theory, where Gann was making all of this uh, trades and uh, just amazing material that he was publishing and he was living was um, in the times of such amazing stock market operators um, he later on started uh, became an editor of the magazine of Wall Street uh, just a very big subscription um, and this is so cool to see also Western Union Telegram um, and then he published quite a few books. Now, also a question about the books. Should I read the books? Yes. If you're a beginner and intermediate white coffee, you should definitely have those. They are not necessarily the books where you could extract a systematic approach to trading, but you will find a lot of the great advices and some of the elements on tactics as well. You just would have to read all of this and extract this information from those books. Um, again, if you want to a shortcut to the knowledge, then uh, start with the course, read Bruce's blog, read specific books, that I'm giving you, and this is my advice for the beginners and to intermediate traders, uh, like off and traders. For the advanced traders, my conversation with you is going to be uh, slightly different, and it's going to be more about let's put the chart on and let's talk about it. Let's analyze it and let's figure out the way to understand it better. So that's the way how I teach. All right. Let's talk about the composite operator. So what is this concept that Wyckoff uh, talked about, composite operator, or like Gary always would say, a composite man? Well, a composite um, operator or a composite man is a heuristic. It's a device that helps us to understand um, how the price structure is being formed and why. So um, I'm going to translate this into modern terms. We're basically talking about um, large institutions as, um, um, as a group of uh, investors and traders that um, influence uh, the price structure in a very big way. Because of their huge size, and think about uh, something like, um, you know, PIM. Uh, Pimco or Warren Buffett or uh, BlackRock um, and multiple other huge institutions um, and they could be hedge funds, they could be uh, banks, they could be uh, any type of financial institutions like pension funds, insurance companies and by the way those have so much money and I worked with um, um, institutional investors and I still do and it always surprises me, you know, the, the size that they have, the requirements that they have for trading. It's a different type of trading than um, retail trading. So all of those institutions, if they're conducting their campaign the same way, they're becoming a big force behind the buying and selling in the markets. And that's what moves the price. And that's what absorbs the supply. And that's what um, creates uh, points of liquidity 
um, where they operate. And um, Wyckoff called it a composite man. And the assumption was that because of the size, they can dictate the potential bias of the next move, which is absolutely, uh, absolutely true. The more money you have, then the more you invest into the stock, you, the more you control. Um, so he called it a composite man. He was suggesting that multiple uh, stock operators could be marking up or marking down the price and conducting those campaigns. In our days, I am talking only about the institutions. I will mention the composite man or the composite operator, and you should be able to understand this concept. All right, um, let's talk about the price cycle. And uh, we also will go into the case study on Apple, um, where I'll show you how uh, specifically at that spot Apple was selected and how you know the, the, the trade was conducted. But first, let's talk about more of the theoretical price cycle. So um, as we've talked about the composite operator, I also want to talk about the difference between strong hands and weak hands. We usually would be thinking that, um, and this is how we are, unfortunately were told or taught, um, that the weak hands are always public hands. This is absolutely not true. And actually, if that would be true, the market would have a different look and a different structure. Um, the weak hands could be both public and institutional hands. And as I work with institutional, as I worked with institutional traders, I must tell you guys that institutions are like us, skin and bone. They are human as well. They are driven by the same emotions that we have. They have the same brain. The only difference between them and us, a couple of things. First of all, it's their nine to five job. That's number one. So they devote much more attention to what they do. Secondly, they have an enormous size, an enormous edge in how they receive the information. And those are the advantages um, that kind of propel them in a lot of cases to the strong hands. But every year in every type of market, since I started or, um, you know, uh, teaching, trading, you know, learning this stuff, uh, working in the financial field. Every year I read the articles that over 90% of all of the hedge funds are failing to outperform the markets. And that's why uh, the latest idea, and I love um, Warren Buffett's idea, is that um, you might as well in the secular bull market just inv invest into the ETFs, market ETFs, you could uh, make uh, a more selective trade like this based on the sectors and groups, not specifically stocks. Um, but it's been very, very successful. And uh, as we know, Warren has won a bet that lasted for what, like 10 years, I think, uh, $1 million that ETFs, market ETFs are, are going to outperform. That was a, a very low risk bet. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, Warren knows a lot about that stuff. So we could see how sometimes we could confuse institutions with strong hands. I don't want you to think this way. I want you to restructure your thinking here and think not in terms of institutions and public, but in terms of strong hands and weak hands. And then we're going to say that usually strong hands are going to be the composite operator, Composite operator is going to uh, have huge size. And the time frame for the composite operator is always going to be a business cycle and beyond that. Think about Warren Buffett and his average holding period for a winning or even non-winning stock. It's not a year. It's not two years. It's not five years. It's a decade or two. I mean, some of the holdings that he has had throughout his career um, it's just been there uh, for a long, long time. Um, so this is the uh, trait and the characteristic of the composite operator. Why is this important? Well, because their behaviors are going to be based 
on the needs that they have. They have a need to establish a huge, sizable position, and they need to hold on to this position for quite some time. They cannot go in today and you know close the position tomorrow. It wouldn't make sense to them at all. The taxation um, problems that they will incur, that's number one problem. And then the uh, um, uh, portfolio rotation, that's number two problem. And then just generally going in, going out, as you might know even from your own trading, is very dangerous because you increase in the number of mistakes that you make. And these are the things that I'm hearing from institutional clients that I have, that those are the big things that, you know, they pay attention a lot. Then we're going to have, after the composite um, operator, which is basically a contrarian in a lot of ways, uh, we're going to have a lot of institutional trend followers. Those are also, also big size institutions, and they usually at the mark look at the market cycle time frame, meaning that their positions are probably going to be beyond a year. You know, this is going to be favorable from the uh, taxation point of view. Um, but they're going to be acting a lot as a composite operator and jump on the emerging trend and uh, jump uh, off the trend once they see the signs of deterioration. And they're going to pick up the time frame that's going to allow them to park the money for quite a long time to ride the whole uptrend and then uh, distribute either on the way up during the consolidation or on the way down. And that's what produces uh, this compounding effect and you know uh, big profits that they accumulate throughout the years. Also, um, on the strong hands, side we're going to have professional traders and here under the professional traders i probably should mention that there are pros that are institutional pros and then there are uh, retail pros obviously institutional pros are going to have you know a, a somewhat a larger size but a very serious retail uh, professionals um, uh, are going to be having also a good size a good professional is not going to have a low, um, um, a small size on, um, on equity just because it doesn't make sense. Uh, with the risk management, you have to control the risk in a specific way, so you can't commit uh, all of the capital, you know, to a specific position or to, um, you know, a few positions. You're going to, um, you know, control your risk um, and portfolio risk. Um, uh, through some of the techniques that they have and therefore you have to have a size. So this is still a very sizable group that is uh, a professional group and um, in a lot of cases they could be strong hands and be on the right side of the bias. On the weak hands um, side we're still going to talk about the retail traders as the public but we also will talk about institutional and professional managers and I mentioned to you just um, um, a minute or so ago that those people could be wrong too. Our first assumption, you know, when we started uh, studying uh, Wyckoff methodology that strong hands, institutional hands are always correct. Well, that's not right. I've seen it myself. I mean, I've coached them. I've mentored them. I've uh, taught them the method. I saw their mistakes. Um, a lot of them are just, you know, like us, they just have more time to devote to this craft. And, you know, as we in any profession, somebody is good, somebody is better, and somebody is not that great. And this, mar uh, you know, the market is unforgiving, the clients are unforgiving. So um, if you're not progress um, with your studies, understandings of the market and your execution, you will be out really fast. So let's look at um, the price cycle itself. And now let's try to understand the behaviors of strong and weak hands. How would they behave at different spots of the price cycle? Well, first of all, the price cycle itself is just a representation of the um, accumulation period um, under the oversold condition where the sentiment changes from bearish to bullish. 
that goes into the markup phase based on the absorption of the supply and not availability of that supply by institutions uh, throughout the markup uh, phase. And then into the area of the distribution, the area where um, a big, uh, strong hands are going to start distributing the stock. Um, and that's going to be in the extreme all about condition and where the sentiment is going to start shifting like it did in September, October of the of 2018 into the uh, uh, from the bullish bias, a bullish sentiment into a bearish sentiment. And then um, as this distribution happens, that starts the markdown, a downtrend where on the way down, we're going to see different groups to capitulate at different points. And we'll talk about that as well in more details later on in the course. Now, each group is going to have specific um, emotional or psychological characteristics. And um, they behave in a specific way. Shahid, thank you so much for being here. And by the way, if anybody has to go, don't forget that, you know, I'm going to post this video on YouTube so you could check it out later. So, yeah, I really appreciate it, especially for those of you who are in Europe right now or in the Middle East or in Asia. I understand your commitment and I appreciate this and um, I see you. So thank you for that. Um, so let's talk about that sentiment and the psychological landscape and the behaviors. Of strong and weak hands. Well, we know that in the downtrend, into the conclusion of the downtrend, into the stop in action, which will be defined by, as a selling climax, we're going to have extreme point of fear and capitulation by weak hands. Don't forget that weak hands are not necessarily just public. They are also institutional, professional hands. And therefore, that capitulation by that uh, big amount of money that they carry, the equity that they have, is going to produce that quick move to the downside where they're saying, get me out at any price. I don't care. I'm done. I have too much of a pain. And my clients are, are on my back. So at that point of time, what this does, it creates, this type of action creates liquidity. And it also creates, with the price moving down, a value proposition to a composite operator. And we must say that it's not just liquidity, it's a high liquidity. And it's not just a value, but it's an extreme value on the long-term basis and a short-term basis. And that's exactly what people like Warren Buffett, Jim Rogers love. They want to come in and they want to take the stock at the best price and with the best availability, where everybody is giving up in bunches and they're just saying, okay, I'll take it. I see the value here. And maybe not in three months, maybe not in six months, I will make money. But in a year, two, as the price develops, um, uh, more favor into a more favorable structure and as the business conditions improve whether it's market conditions whether it's an industry group condition and uh, whether um, you know this is just a stock related conditions they're just basically saying that long term I see value and I see that this is an extreme point I'm going to come in and I'm going to buy I'm going to establish that initial position or a chunk of my position this is going to be the uh, place where you, we will identify on the chart the first science of intelligent accumulation by strong hands. And then throughout the whole trading range, a lot of people are still going to be disbelievers uh, of the next bias that's going to come. So therefore, as the composite operator is going to buy on average at the lower price of the trading range. And um, that would produce the rallies. That's gonna subsequently retest the uh, levels of the support. 
and where the composite man is going to start adding to the position every time it hits their buying point. The sentiment gradually is going to change. Those bearers that were actively and aggressively selling, they're going to see that their trades don't work or they work, but not that, that great uh, as in the downtrend, and they're going to give up. Some of the weak hands are going to um, you know, give up their latest um, uh, latest um, additions maybe or the positions that they have had and they've held even through the downtrend. Um, and the uh, composite man is just going to scoop uh, all of the latest offering. And that's going to absorb the supply to the point where technically the price will start making higher highs and higher lows. This is where the emergence of a trend is going to occur. And this is an extremely important concept. Emergence of the trend is everything that I talk to institutional man money managers. All of their systems are just basically based either on the contrarian value proposition or the emergence um, of um, a substantial trend. And this is where the what I call the institutional trend followers are going to come in. And they're going to start establishing their positions. That will push the price even further up. The public is still not actively participating at this point because they are scared. They just had the pain of a loss that uh, they incurred throughout the whole trading range. So as the price continues to the upside, this is where they are starting to become very active. It's in the second part um, of an uptrend of the markup phase. And because they are getting excited here, and they are producing more volume and they are sustaining the selling by institutions that are selling now into the strength of the weekends. Once that strength is exhausted, the selling is going to start producing the price structure that's going to resemble more of a consolidation. And when all of the buyers are going to be exhausted by this process, the price will start to deteriorate and it's going to start showing lower lows. By that time, the smart money the real smart money in that particular position. And by the way, smart money as I see it now with all of this knowledge and experience that I have teaching and trading and working with people, whether institutional retail people, um, the smart money definition is only uh, relevant to the last trade that you make. So in a way, it's kind of like, um, as like in NBA, a miss, a make or miss league, right? So you always have to be at that performance level where you're not just producing the positive result, but you are actually outperforming the index. Otherwise, why would they give you the money to manage? They could just give it to the market, put it in the ETFs, and just be done with that. So um, this, the definition for each of the institutions always changes with a specific trade. And they could be in one trade uh, uh, representing smart money and in another trade they could be representing you know, uh, weak hands. And Buffett is a good example. I mean, like look at his, uh, for instance, the trade in IBM where he came in and then he had to close out with the loss and relatively soon as he opened the position. So um, even even here, you know, could be weak hands at some point of time. So weak hands at this point of time, I see this as a value for the first time. They saw the value on the way up and they were correct here. They were enjoying the profits. They saw the value at the points of the lows at the support level in the consolidation, thinking that there's gonna be a continuation. Um, and then they're still seeing the value even as the price starts to deteriorate. And this is where everything collapses because uh, strong hands are out of the position, um, completely the composite man is out of the position, or it's just hedge in a way um, that still produces some kind of bearish sentiment. 
and then the weak hands um, are just capitulating um, in the markdown phase uh, and that's what produces um, a quick move to the downside no buying and selling and not just selling not an orderly selling but the capitulation that's why bear markets are so quick so aggressive um, and so volatile all right um, let's go to the next slide and guys I'm gonna speed up at this point again um, so I'm gonna come back to your comments maybe you know a little bit later on um, so here is an example of the price cycle with an Apple stock this is a weekly chart uh, this is actually not the beginning of the cycle this is just a reaccumulation of a much larger cycle that has started in 2009 low and we're seeing the last reaccumulation before the distribution actually occurs and we're seeing how after the consolidation with the bias to the upside we have a really good markup phase distribution after that which leads us to the uh, new low in 2013 uh, accumulation again and then the next move to the upside and uh, distribution again consolidation in 2016 and you all know what has happened here and what has happened just lately and you kind of could see that this goes on and on and on and obviously price cycle could look slightly different um, on a secular basis for different stocks but for this particular stock you could you could take the, this cycle even from the uh, point of the IPO uh, from the 1987 to 2003 trading range uh, which was a huge period you know to be in that type of range with one huge big rally in the middle um, but after that it's all like that um, this is just has been a pattern for Apple so our goal is to understand what is happening in those consolidations because it seems that it's out of those consolidations that we have the moves that we want to uh, participate in and those are directional trades obviously you could use you know some hedge uh, uh, trades um, even in the uh, uptrends and downtrends as well um, this is totally acceptable if you understand how to do this but uh, the course is just concentrating on the directional bias on identification of that bias on the timing of when the price is going to exhibit that buy so start exhibiting on the emergence of the trend and then obviously on the character of the move itself and not only that during the whole you know markup markdown phase especially markup we are gonna have a lot of spots a lot of consolidations where um, we're gonna apply our wike of analysis whether it's a phase analysis or price and volume analysis um, and we're going to identify specific places of timing where we want to establish a position for the next potential swing to the upside and hopefully you guys uh, have seen this type of um, trading um, you know from the uh, case studies that I presented on my trades by the way on the YouTube channel I have uh, also published you know quite a few trades um, and um, you know all of my students here you guys know that I usually discuss my trades again this is something that I don't shy away I think that you know there should be more of that it doesn't matter whether it's a mistake or a profitable trade what matters is knowledge can we extract the knowledge from any of the trades all right so let's look now at the first reaccumulation box and let's look at the selection process that we would go through oh another slide I'm sorry okay so before that before we do that couple of things on this slide uh, this is a very old slide this is the slide that I created almost 10 years ago and this slide was based on um, Hank's prudent um, And I don't know whether it was Hank who kind of originated this um, idea. I think it was actually originally the idea from the Stock Market Institute. Um, it's an idea of an action 
and test. Uh, the only thing here that I added here is the reaction. Right? So we have kind of like three things that are unfolding. Action to the downside, reaction to that as a stop in action and a consolidation. And then the test of this reaction. Is this test going to fail and the price is going to go lower? Or is it going to stop, reverse, and the new trend is going to emerge? And we obviously could go even into a downtrend, uh, I'm sorry, into the consolidation and use the same thing. We could say that selling climax by itself is an action. Uh, that is being followed by the reaction of the automatic rally and then being followed by the test of the secondary test in phase uh, A. Or we could say that, um, uh, as, I'm, um, uh, as I told you before, the downtrend is an action. And then phase A and phase B is a reaction to that action. And phase C is a test uh, to that uh, reaction uh, to that action. And the main thing that we want to identify within this process is the test in action. Because the test in action usually is going to be identified by us as a, uh, not just the testing tool, but also as a timing tool as well. If the test is successful, then most likely there's going to be a continuation of the bias that we think uh, uh, is developing during the consolidation. So therefore, the timing is going to be um, identified by us as a potential phase C. So each time we identify phase C, we're going to assume that this is the beginning of the next major move. And that's why phase C is so crucial. Well, phase, if phase C is the low of the trend or the high of the trend, kind of like an extreme point of the trend, the beginning of the trend. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are thinking, well, what about if phase B has, you know, a low, a low, then phase C, or a high, a high, then phase C? Uh, you could be right in terms of the actual definition of the, uh, of the trend. But still, we would prefer to be more efficient with our point of entry. We don't necessarily want to enter in phase B into the position. We want to enter into the position when the price is ready to move in the direction of the bias. So phase C is extremely important, and so is phase D. Why is phase D important? Well, because phase D is all about emergence of the trend. And phase D is all about a change of character that is being confirmed from a non-trending environment we are switching to a trending environment with the specific bias. Talking about Hank, I mentioned him. Uh, obviously, Hank has passed uh, suddenly. Um, his last presentation was uh, in August of 2017, uh, even, you know, talking a bit, uh, about him right now, I kind of, you know, feel still so sad. Um, he was a great man. Um, he was definitely my first mentor here um, in the U.S., and um, I owe him my career, basically. Um, and uh, not just from the perspective of the Wyckoff Method, which I consider him kind of like he was a guardian. You know, he was always, uh, he would always criticize me for bringing innovation into the method, you know, bringing something like, um, you know, ro those Romanism, you know, students call those Romanisms, you know, like new definitions, uh, new ideas, and so on and so forth. He was uh, a kind of like protecting the methodology in a, in a, very interesting way um, and uh, he not only uh, you know initially uh, and together with Bruce they taught that class but I think the first class I actually took from Hank by himself um, not only uh, did he uh, taught me the methodology but 
he also taught me a lot of the business, uh, uh, you know, and in a way, you know, the community that we have built with Wyckoff Analytics, you know, it has Hank's presence, you know, it's uh, a lot of the things that um, I've implemented and our team implemented is just based on Hank's work at Golden Gate University and I'm just uh, so happy and I feel privileged that I worked so closely with him um, in the last six, seven years uh, and I've been in his classes. I always was advising students to take his class, at least one, at least one. Uh, he was a very unique teacher and a lot of the teaching techniques also I'm, I'm taking from him. Um, it's just a very uh, extraordinary person and uh, an extremely significant figure in my life, in my uh, not just professional life, but partially also in a personal life. And um, you know, just his whole family, it just was so nice and it's still nice to me and just I'm so sad that he's gone. Um, but he lives through us and this is the biggest thing that we could do for him and his family is just to remember him and remember him in the way how he was teaching us, you know, to conduct ourselves and conduct ourselves in the markets. Um, his book, uh, which is called The Three Skills of Top Trading, is a required book for our students. And I definitely recommend this book to all of you to read. Uh, chapters three to seven specifically talk about the Wyckoff Method, and those are the required chapters um, that I usually ask students to read. In this picture, this uh, award he's holding is the award of the Chartered Market Technician that he received, I think, in April, and he passed away in August, so um, just months before he passed away. And um, uh, not only he had received it from the Chartered uh, chart Market Technician, which is the biggest technical analysis organization here in the US and around the world, but also from IFTA, International Federation of Technical Analysts, um, at the 2013 conference in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, he definitely deserved it so much uh, for, uh, for the times when the methodology was not in a good shape for like 20, 30 years, um, it was not necessarily very, very profoundly highlighted as a technical analysis skill. Hank um, and uh, Tom Williams, David Wise, uh, Craig Schroeder, those are the four big figures at that time. And then new generation of Wyckoffians uh, came like Bruce, and we had quite a few Wyckoffians came out of uh, those classes, like Jim Forte and so on and so forth. And then, you know, my generation came and we became also, you know, uh, more knowledgeable about methodology just because of him. You know, so um, just a lot of kudos to him and uh, the way how he conducted his life and the way how he was with students. Uh, uh, I just, you know, still so many stories about that. Tito, Eric. Uh, I miss him too. All right, let's talk about the case study. So this is Apple. We are looking at that trading range before the big move up, actually, this is the range. Um, and it's a complex range because you have a trading structure, a trading range structure on the trading range structure. Actually, I was in this trade to the downside. Apple was underperforming around this area. Uh, this was the trade um, and closed out somewhere here. Um, so what does this trade tell us? Um, that uh, there is no ability to go down. Uh, the supply is not increasing over different um, other areas, uh, and uh, that suggests a, uh, a reversal, uh, a change of bias, and change of leadership, which we see on the sign of strength rally. We definitely exhibiting more uh, over leadership uh, over the market. Looking at the relative strength ratio line, and this is something that we will explore. I will show you how to construct it. I will. Um, 
show you how to use it. I will show you how to interpret it. But here we're seeing that um, the relative strength is showing outperformance by Apple on this rally to the upside. And if you guys remember the market at the time, the market only um, has come to the high of the resistance and then went into the shakeout. And even on the shakeout, we see outperformance by Apple where the market is creating a low low and the stock is creating a high low. So strength, strength, which is great. And this would be, based on the rel comparative analysis, for us a point of selection. Now there is one minus to what is going on here, and that is that supply is suddenly up. And we know when supply is going up, we always need a retest. And we have multiple retests, um, which uh, start to create uh, a trading range. And therefore, when we go into the trading range, again, the things that we need to define is bias, timing, and character. And this is not necessarily the sequence with which Wyckoff was approaching this, or SMI was approaching this, or how I was taught at Golden Gate University. This is just what we've created for the WTC course, and this is how I teach the material right now. Those are the three elements that are extremely crucial to me to understand. I want to understand where the price is going to go, when it's going to go, and how it's going to go up. So um, as we go through the analysis of the consolidation, we are going through the phase analysis. And we are also going through the supply and demand analysis uh, together with how the price reacts to that supply and demand. And we're seeing that supply is diminishing significantly into the area that uh, looks to us as a potential phase C. So that defines not only the absorption of the supply, which gives us a bias to the upside, but it also gives us a timing. The time is now. Supply is very low. It's in strong hands. We could talk about also um, a short-term underperformance, uh, which usually leads to great buying opportunities within the structure of the whole price cycle. And this is something that we will concentrate on as well. And then obviously the whole campaign. And then uh, the next biggest wike of uh, identification for us would be a change of character. Um, I actually, uh, I did not trade this particular rally in Apple, but I had multiple students uh, back at Golden Gate um, and in my private practice that were trading Apple at the time. I wonder if you could guess where they exited their position. Well, before you even answer this, I'm going to tell you exactly where. Here, here, and here. And why do you think this is? What would be the logic of getting out of this position? I mean, obviously, except for the logic of smaller swing trade, which it wasn't. It was more of a big swing trade like this one or like this one from one trading range to another, from one structure to another. Well, their logic was that supply is coming here. And my argument with them at the time was that Look at the result of this supply coming in. And that's a very, very common mistake that students make. And that's why we're going to study a lot the result and effort. This is one of the most important concepts. If I would be picking the concept to teach, whether the concept of the supply overcoming the demand and the price going down or a demand overcoming the supply um, and going up in comparison to the effort and the result, I would choose effort and the result. Supply and demand is a very simplistic concept, but effort and the result requires an understanding and a, a visual skill of recognition. And that's exactly what's happening here. And that's exactly the mistake that we were trying to correct at that time. The key to the exit was a different behavior than we've exhibited on the way up. Look at all of the reactions on the way up. They are very small. 
And even though some of the volume signature increases in there, there is absorption on the way up. As supply occurs, it's being absorbed and the price moves up. But not on this reaction, not on the automatic uh, reaction, which acts as a change of character. We see that not only supply is emerging um, in um, a lot, but it's also very consistent. And this is another um, definition that we've added to the Wyckoff trading course. Usually volume is being interpreted as just increase and the decrease, but we could see the consistency of selling in this area, as we have seen the consistency of selling here and here attempt to sell. And what does this suggest? In all of these cases, it suggests a change of environment. So from the uptrend environment, we are uh, going into a non-trending environment or a trading range. And at least minimally at this point, you should start thinking in your head, what should I do? Should I close out the positions? Should I scale out? If I'm anticipating a trading range, is this a very long-term trend, campaign trade for me? Then I should probably check out my PNF targets from back then in 2009, 2010. I'll compare them with the PNF targets that we've just recently had, you know, in the trading ranges. Um, so. Um, we would be making a decision here, but that decision would be based initially on the way how the price behaves on this reaction. Uh, and this is the skill and the knowledge that I'm gonna give you guys. All right, 530, let me see. Okay. All right, let me see what we are gonna, let's stop here. Uh, let's stop here. So. Um, what we are going to do is, um, obviously, we haven't gone through the whole um, material that I was planning for today, but this is great because uh, what I'm going to ask you guys, for those of you who already signed up, is um, I'm going to ask you to read and I'm going to ask you to watch the videos and I'm going to ask you to prepare for the second class. And then we will... Um, you know, go into the change of character, accumulation, and the distribution. I actually like that a lot. Uh, there is a question. Have the seminar been recorded from George? Yes. I'm recording it right now, and I'm going to post it on our YouTube channel, Wyckoff Trading Method. So uh, you could probably check it out tomorrow morning or even late tonight. Uh, my team, you know, will upload it and, uh, you know, put the description in. So check it out. Again, for those of you who are uh, thinking about signing up for this course, let me just go to the correct page. Uh, so make sure that you go to wikofanalytics.com, that you find uh, Wikof Trading Course, and uh, um, just uh, sign up before next Monday, which is January 14th, uh, to get the discounted price. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, reach us at wikofassociates at gmail.com. You could find our uh, contact information on our website um, and, you know, just address it either to me or to our team and we'll uh, be more than happy to answer. I'm available tonight and uh, tomorrow and throughout the week. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, uh, you know, maybe on the administrative uh, side or maybe content questions, you know, don't hesitate to, um, to contact us. Meanwhile, students who signed up, I will email you tomorrow and I will assign you the homework, which will be just region specific um, you know, chapters of Hank's book, Bruce's blogs, um, and watching our videos on YouTube. And that will be your homework. And then after the first class, once we cover change of character, accumulation and distribution traits, then we will, um, we will go into the homework and you'll do the actual homework. Well, really great class, really 
a great beginning. I feel like there is a, a lot of interaction from you guys. So hopefully that's going to just transition into the class itself. Let me just see um, kind of like uh, last comments here uh, from Doug. Oh, I love this comment. Uh, my brain hurts. Great detail session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And I know that you've taken classes from us, so uh, you've been a student, so um, that's how it is. Uh, thank you very much. Great information to consider. I trade commodities. I was very interested in the program. So let me kind of like uh, address this. And I think that there was another question here on Forex. So I've actually traded Forex for almost five years. It just was a little bit tough to intraday trade something like this, living on the West Coast in the US. Um, just so hectic during the night, um, you know, to stay up. Um, so I kind of gave it up. But um, Forex has the same price structure as, you know, other price structures. There are some nuances, obviously, volatility, um, interventions, and then also there is just um, always the reference to the bad volume data. Um, so my answer to Forex traders is that take the course. Why? Well, because the price structural analysis is still a must. You have to understand the context of where you operate, where you trade. So that's number one. Secondly, some of the Forex traders use volume signature. So you can do that. Thirdly, relative and comparative analysis is still relevant in Forex um, markets. And one of my strategies was always buying the strongest of the correlated pairs and selling the weakest of the correlated pairs. And you could create pair trading like this or spread trading. You could just choose directionally which um, you know instrument you want to uh, pick. So there are quite a few things there are on the analytical level that you could use. And then um, you could also uh, use a lot of tactics. And tactical decisions is something that you have to develop as a trader one way or another. So whenever I talk to Forex traders, I always tell them that this could be a foundational course for you. This could be the course where that kind of like defines the foundation on which you build further up. So consider that. Uh, and the same for the commodities traders. I actually love trading commodities. Um, I love trading the e I've uh, day traded the e for quite some time. Um, occasionally, I would make those trades here and there now. I predominantly trade um, stocks right now and specifically options, um, but I love trading oil, um, I trade gold, um, um, I trade metal sometimes whenever opportunity presents itself. Um, so to me, trading is not about a specific instrument. Trading to me is about specific opportunity. And I think when you are becoming more and more advanced trader, you will understand that opportunities um, are very rare. Uh, good opportunities are very rare. And our goal is to recognize them. And even when you recognize opportunities in the market, sometimes you fail you know, to see them or act on them. Um, and sometimes opportunities come from um, very interesting places. Sometimes you would be thinking, oh, I trade stocks so that, you know, I'm not going to trade other markets. Well, if you're a speculator and if you're an advanced trader, then you should consider that. Uh, sometimes you look at um, different time frames and you see how, let's say, a long-term campaign would be much more profitable than, let's say, swing trading or intraday trading. And you should recognize that as an advanced trader. So this is something that you know we talked more in the practicum, you know, with more advanced students, and this is something that you know we have to. I have to bring you to that level. Okay, great. Um, next comments and some questions here. Uh, Ramon, it would be great if you set a number to the slides to have the reference to our notes. Eric, yes, for sure. If you are a student in this class, I can definitely do that for you. Um, I'm not going to distribute the slides for people who are just guests. Um, um, this is just kind of like a rule for this session. Um, the biggest value is obviously I'm trying to give to the students who already signed up. Uh, but you know, once in the class, remind me and I'll do that. Uh, what are the tools that are necessary to do the homework? This is a great question. 
uh, from Justin. So um, one of the things that I want you guys to do is obviously, and I mentioned this, uh, bring me one file, email me one file that is going to be either PowerPoint, PDF, or Word doc. That's number one, requirement number one. Name it correctly so that I would know that it comes from you and that this is the homework number one or whatever. And then um, thirdly, you know, as you use these tools, you probably have to understand how to capture the screen. Let's say if you're on stock charts, uh, capture the screen, cut and, and paste into the PowerPoint, and then annotate those. So that's the process. And we could talk more about it uh, if you still have some questions, um, you know, during the next class. So um, I'll explain more how to do this. And actually, I'll maybe I'll have a slide on some, you know, usual practices. All right. Next question or comment. Uh, this come from Lim. Uh, although Wyckoff method could fit in into any time frame, understanding your trading style is more um, uh, of a spin trading. Would the course curriculum be suitable for position traders who mainly hold stock for a few months to a year or more? Uh, absolutely. And actually, I kind of slightly disagree with the way, Lim, how you phrased the question, but I understand what you're saying here. Um, a, a good swing trader should understand the long-term campaign. And therefore, I teach you in Wyckoff Trading course a long-term campaign and swing trades within that long-term campaign. So a long-term campaign is going to be something where uh, we will establish a long-term trend first, and then we will seek for the short-term uh, counter trends, which could be a trading range by itself or a reaction within the context of a much larger uh, trend. And you have to understand long-term campaigns. So if you're a long-term campaigner and if you're holding uh, your positions from a few months to a year and more, you definitely will benefit from the course. Good question. Uh, from Igor, how do you determine the strong and weak currency? So I mentioned uh, correlated currencies, let's say like um, British pound to the US dollar, um, and let's say euro to the US dollar. So there are times when they are highly correlated and they're when they are less correlated, right? Um, so it's during the times when they are highly correlated and you have to define it. And there are sites that would tell you this. Um, and I would, and you could see it from the chart as well when correlation is very strong. It's when this correlation is strong, this is where you want to um, use this concept and um, based on the comparative analysis, just to define which one is stronger, which one is weaker. Um, and if you're making directional trades, just uh, to take the trade um, in the direction of the buys uh, and you know use that definition. You could also use this uh, for uh, spread trading or pair trading, um, buying one currency, selling another currency, however you would create that type of strategy, and then uh, trying to define the spots where the spread is increasing, and it always goes up and down, and has you know sometimes it has a trend of its own, especially when correlation goes away. Um, so you could create trades out of that as well. So have, hopefully that explains it. Hmm. Um, Okay, Craig is saying that my microphone is not working really well and that uh, my voice is breaking up. Is that is that true for everyone, guys? How's my audio, by the way? I just want to know. This could be just either on your end or oh, my voice could be just um, going down. Um, and um, sometimes connection is not that great. So sometimes too much traffic. Yeah, okay, well, let me see what kind of audio we're we gonna have on this, um, on this, uh, yeah, on this uh, recording. I apologize if uh, not everything was very clear and uh, uh, Craig, thank you for noticing this. 
All right. Uh, last question, and then we're gonna stop. Um, Roman, which is uh, what's the difference between uh, uh, Wyke of Trading Course and Wyke of Practicum? All right. So uh, the Wyke of Trading Course, think of this as a knowledge, and Wyke of uh, Practicum is something that uh, a student with the knowledge does not have. That is a skill of recognition of those concepts that you know now. So I always tell my students, knowledge uh, is not necessarily the skill of visual recognition. If you acquire the skill of visual recognition, you will see how the um, structure, the bias, the timing, the character unfolds. Now, my next statement is going to be that even if you acquired a skill of visual recognition, it doesn't mean that you can execute it. So you have to build the skill of execution. Those are tactics. Even if you conquer that, you still have to conquer the emotional part of trading. And that means that you will have to look deeply into your behaviors trading behaviors, translate those into your life behaviors, compare those, and figure out how you fit into your trading style and into your methodology and so on and so forth. And this is definitely a very, very advanced level. Whenever I have a beginner or intermediate trader come to me and they say, I want to work on my mental outlook, I say no. You have to study first the methodology. You have to be comfortable with the technical analysis and recognition of those patterns so much that it doesn't distract your brain from concentrating on your mental landscape adjustments. And this is definitely a topic for another long conversation. All right, guys, I think that's it for today. Great session. Thank you for all of your comments, for all of your questions. This has been a blast. A great first session for those of you who signed up or are thinking about signing up. I'm looking forward to working with you. As you could see, you know, a lot of material we have to uh, to cover in this 15 sessions. Uh, so we're going to start working more uh, next class. Make sure that you have a headset and a speaker um, as we're going to uh, interact. And um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.